Well, good afternoon and welcome to late, NACTA's latest virtual program on NIL. Uh, my role today is to welcome you and to introduce Len DeLuca, an old friend who will then introduce the panelists. Thank you, Bob. Len DeLuca has been a leader in sports entertainment for IMG, ESPN, and CBS since 1980. Since 2015, he has served as Senior VP of Original Content and Endeavor IMG. Len runs DeLuca and Associates, a media strategy firm consulting and representing Golston and Stores. DeLuca served as Senior VP Programming and Acquisitions at ESPN from 1996 to 2010. Prior to ESPN, Len served as VP of Programming at CBS Sports from 79 to 96, and he was responsible for CBS' first 15 NCAA Men's Basketball Championships, the road to the Final Four, and extensions through 2000. Currently, Len is an assistant professor at the prestigious NYU Stern Entertainment, Media, and Technology Graduate Program. Len also teaches at NYU's School of Professional Studies, Tisch Institute for Global Sport, and at Seton Hall Stillman School of Business. A native Rhode Islander, and I got to put this in because he's a big BC guy, Lenny practiced law after earning his BA magna cum laude and JD from BC and BC Law School. Len, take it away. Bob, that's much too kind. And my word, did you edit that uh, brilliantly and you read everything I sent you? Thank you, everybody, and hello, everybody. Um, a lot of old friends in the audience uh, since I've been in college athletics since 1982. Happy to bring you this spectrum of talent. Um, this is much like some of the best shows we did at ESPN and experience, both from colleges and the legal profession. Without further ado, let me introduce Julie Rupert, uh, who has been the commissioner of the Northeast 10 Conference since 2008. Um, the Northeast 10 comprises 14 Division II schools in New England and New York, from Adelphi to St. Anselm College. Uh, Julie's husband is an athletic director. He is the deputy AD at Bryant. Uh, Julie is a member of the Division II Long Range Task Force. Also joining us today from Pullman is Pat Chun, who has been the athletic director at Washington State since 2018 after five years at Florida Atlantic University. Pat was the Under Armour AD of the year in 2018 and a member of the and is a member of the NACTA executive committee and incoming third vice president. Since 2016, our next guest, Ward Manuel, is the athletic director at the University of Michigan, a school where he earns no less, earned no less than three degrees. He played for Bo Shevmichel and met his wife there. So Michigan has been great. He has served and currently serves as president of NACTA and formerly was the AD at UConn, where his teams won only six national championships. Finally, Marty Edel on the panel is a director of the firm at Goulson and Stores, an AM Law 200, which in the legal phrase puts you in the top 200 in the country. Named, Marty was named 10 years as an outstanding sports and entertainment lawyer. And uh, since last September, he is the chair of the Goulson and Stores sports law practice. He teaches uh, antitrust and sports law at Columbia Law School and Brooklyn Law School. And I'm finally now delighted to introduce an old friend who is our host. Robin Young is the host of NPR and NPR's Here and Now, uh, hosted by WBUR, a daily um, news program heard by 6 million viewers and, and listeners. She has won Edward R. Murrow, Peabody, Emmys in her 30 plus years on, on news, radio, and television. She also is the only person in this webinar who has ever directed a Red Sox or a Bruins telecast on television. Um, and she's a friend of mine since the 1970s. Robin, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. Unmute yourself and let's go. Thank you, Lennon. I have to say, you didn't do your math because I wrote that biography that you were cheating off of uh, about 20 years ago. So it's actually a 
a lot more years in broadcasting, but um, it's good to see you, my friend. And I want to get started right away. Uh, July 1st, stroke of midnight, it all began. Hannah and Haley Cavender from Fresno State's basketball team became spokeswomen for Boost Mobile. Five members of the Jackson State football team signed a deal with Three Kings grooming products. And my personal favorite, uh, Florida State's uh, Dylan Gibbons announced that he is going to use the new NIL rules to raise money on GoFundMe to help a friend, the severely disabled Timothy Donovan, travel to a game. Uh, it is happening. And all of you out there, I see that a lot of um, directors are still joining. I mean, the, those of you who are still joining the sportscast will reintroduce ourselves to the sportscast. This webinar uh, will reintroduce ourselves as we go along. But hundreds of people are here because, you know, this is your wheelhouse, not mine. But I get the feeling a lot of people aren't prepared. So let's start with uh, Marty Dell with some context. Tell us more about yourself and what you do, as well as a little more about the Goulston Stores connection. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm Martin Edell, as Robin just introduced me. I chair the Goulston and Stores College Sports Law Practice. Goulston and Stores, as Len mentioned, is a national law firm. We're an AMLAW 200 law firm. And we created a college sports law practice to work with colleges, universities and athletic conferences to understand and deal with the increasingly complex set of issues which our practice is focused exclusively on addressing. One issue is name, image and likeness or NIL. NIL revolves around differing state laws and there are many states, I'll get to that in a second, federal law and NCAA regulation and guidance. We are delighted to co-host with NACTA today's discussion on name, image, and likeness. And addressing Robin's question, why NIL and why today? NIL is the right of a college athlete to monetize her or his intellectual property rights through sponsorship deals, media licensing, uh, Twitter, selling of iconic images, or as we now term determine it, non-fungible tokens or NFTs, and many other ways. Until recently, the NCAA prohibited athletes from monetizing their name, image, and likeness on pain of loss of collegiate eligibility. That changed, as Robin just mentioned, on July 1 of this year. On July 1, based on a court decision that held the NCAA violated the antitrust laws by prohibiting students from monetizing their NIL rights, 17 states put into effect laws that permitted students to monetize their NIL rights without loss of eligibility. And another 11 states have NIL laws that will go into effect in the future. As of June 30, the NCAA has said it would not enforce its NIL prohibitions with certain guardrails on that. And of course, the week before, there was the Alston decision by the United States Supreme Court, which dealt with the right uh, to pay to play. Today's webinar will focus on the meaning of the NIL laws and policies. Before I return the program to Robin for NIL, I want you to keep in mind a couple of thoughts as we go through this webinar today for your school and your policy. NIL is an issue that will help you recruit, that will help you empower and educate your student athletes, and will help generate additional sources of revenue. As long as your school recruits athletes from other states, your school needs a policy to stay competitive on recruiting athletes and revenue generation. To stay competitive and create a more level playing field, you need to understand the rules of the game. What do the NIL laws of your state provide? What is the effect of federal laws, such as Title IX, Title VII, and the antitrust laws on NIL? What NIL policies do other schools in your athletic conference have, and what do their states provide as NIL laws? And what NIL policies do competitive colleges and universities who may not be in your conference uh, from other states have and what do their state's laws provide on NIL? That's my background, Robin. 
it's your show. Well, you know, you, you tripped a little bit through the timeline, but it, it seems, I mean, this is this conversation has been going on for a long time, but it seems like it really took off when states began passing laws, California, a, a big one, because as you say, once a state passes a law allowing NIL, then colleges and other states have to think about their competitiveness when it comes to recruiting. You know, how do, and it, then the snowball starts. So uh, I, I would urge people to, consider a huge graph that you have at Goulston and Stores where you have every single state along with questions or at least categories and where that state stands when it comes to things like how can students get agents and how, how would this affect, how would this impact things like scholarships. But, but start with the overarching question. What is the biggest thing a school needs to know right now and they probably know a lot more than they did even a, a couple months ago, but what are the things that you would say to a school, you need to know this, 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 and this? Do you want me to, do you want yeah. me to start with that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So first and foremost, your school needs to know what its culture is. That is, what are the core values of the school that it wants to promote? So that may impact the amount of licensing or sponsorship activities that will, it will permit its student athletes uh, in which to engage. Second, you wanna know, are there any limitations provided by your state? For example, uh, Pat is the athletic director at Washington State. Washington does not have an NIL law at this point. Does that give him free uh, reign to do anything he wants? Ward is from Michigan. Michigan will have an NIL law, uh, but it's not in effect yet. What is he going to do? And of course, Julie, who has five different states, I think, in, her comp in the 14 schools in her conference, has to deal with laws which are in effect in some states and other states which do not have laws. So that's the second item. Third item is, what do your competitors have in effect? That is, what policies do they have and what does their states provide as well? For example, um, Ward, and, and I'll pick on Ward here uh, because he's right in the center of my screen at least, uh, Michigan competes all over the country for student athletes. Alabama has laws in effect, Florida has laws in effect, Georgia has laws in effect, and Ward is competing for student athletes from those states. So is Pat and so is, so is Julie, but I'm picking on Ward here. So it seems to me at least that Ward has to be familiar with what does Alabama law provide? What does Florida law provide? What does Georgia law provide? And of course, there's the issue of what do the conference have? Ward's in the Big Ten. That includes Pennsylvania and Ohio. Pennsylvania has its own NIL law, which will affect what Penn State does, a competitor, a direct competitor in the Big Ten. Yeah. Layered on all of that is what are you going to do about marketing? Um, and there are lots of third party marketers out there. And what are you going to do about federal law, which may impact what you're doing here, including Title IX, Title VII, and to the extent you have conference laws, the antitrust laws as well. I mean, it's just kind of extraordinary. Uh, and here's some other questions. Um, there are some state laws that create an inconsistent variety of restrictions for athletes. So in some states, athletes can endorse alcohol or gambling products. I don't know, is a video game gambling? I, you know, these are questions. Um, some state laws restrict schools from arranging the deals for their athletes. Others say, no, you can help do it. Um, some state laws that are being crafted now address boosters. How much can a team's booster be involved in arranging these deals for kids? I, I want to bring in Ward. We, we're definitely picking on Ward today. Um, <laughs> the director of, of athletics, University of Michigan. You were, Ward, an accomplished uh, student athlete, uh, two-sport athlete. You played football, as we just heard under Bo, Bo Schembechler. Um, we're talking about some of the things the schools have to think about you know, where you stand legally, where you stand competitively. What are you thinking about when it comes to the care of your student athletes? Yeah, and I, I think it's important. Uh, and I, I do want to uh, echo what Marty said. You know, you do have to understand your own culture. 
uh, in your state laws and the policy that we, uh, you know, put together uh, in my staff and in our legal counsel uh, reviewed uh, was really with that in mind. I mean, it's, it's, we want first and foremost, our student athletes to have opportunity. Uh, secondly, we want to protect them uh, as well as our brand, right? The, the copyrighted um, things that we have in place, uh, the things that uh, we have worked for over 200 years here at Michigan to establish. Uh, and so we want uh, them to go out, uh, use their name, image, and likeness to uh, generate uh, additional money in, in income as they, uh, as they can, now that it's uh, available to do either by state laws or now the NCAA. And so for, for me as a former student athlete, I, I look at it uh, with that lens on of, of back when I played, uh, you uh, would go into the store and uh, you would find your teammates. I wasn't good enough. I played, but I wasn't good enough to have my jersey. And then I got injured. So I never had uh, my jersey in stores, but we would go in stores and our teammates jerseys were there to for sale with the name on the back. Uh, a few years ago, maybe a decade ago, most of us stopped that because of this issue, because our student athletes could not receive uh, any income from it. So we, we turned to uh, doing things like putting number one or the date uh, the, of the year, you know, so selling a 21 jersey this year as opposed to uh, putting somebody's name on the back of that, that jersey who wears 21 uh, or who used to wear 21. So those are the things that, that we have evolved to do. Uh, but first and foremost, you know, I'm happy that our student athletes have this opportunity. Uh, and some of them, as you uh, discussed, uh, we're going to get quite lucrative deals. Uh, we have a student athlete who I believe uh, he has 1.5 million followers on uh, Instagram. Uh, and this is something that happened before name, image, and likeness. Uh, and ability to monetize that for him. So he's looking at opportunities to do that. We have some student athletes who have created uh, some unique things around uh, their brand, uh, whether it's t-shirts or, or jerseys that, you know, don't have Michigan on it, but have their uh, number and those kind of things on them uh, in their name. And they, they've, they've done that to create uh, either a marketing company that, that could sell these and, and put them out there. So, I applaud them for their what they're uh, working to do in you know, opportunities that are in front of them. Uh, some are going to make more than others, and that's going to be unique to college athletics, where we've always been a team. Everybody sort of, you know, you have your scholarship. Everybody received the same scholarship. Uh, you, when you take football, for example, uh, now you're going to see uh, some of the quote-unquote stars uh, who can get some lucrative opportunities and those, um, those other players uh, who are not playing as much, uh, not be able to to rise to that level. And so well, hold, yeah, just try on. to deal with that. Yeah, hold up a second there. I want to go to Pat Chun, who's there at uh, Washington State University. Uh, one of the things you're known for doing there, uh, Pat, is including improvements to mental health awareness for all the players. Are you instituting some way of, I mean, I wouldn't have known what to do at that young age with any kind of money coming in for anything but babysitting. I mean, are you instituting some kind of care for kids who might be making a windfall? And then, as we just alluded to, kids who are not, and you wanna still have that team co cohesiveness. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've kind of harnessed it where our, our, our main points our, our main pillars are educate, empower, and protect. I mean, we're no sense. We're exactly what most schools, including Ward's, doing, and we understand our responsibility to our student athletes. Um, the mental health thing is something we have continually have talked about uh, because this does change the whole dynamics of college athletics. There are different pressures when you are your own brand uh, that that go into this, uh, and obviously, so we we are like a lot of schools. We're trying to put our best foot forward. Uh, this is a brand new landscape for all of us. Um, you know, like, like many schools listening here, we, we've partnered, you know, we, we don't believe we are the experts 
You know, we've partnered with our business school to create a one credit course uh, through the entrepreneurship program. I actually sat in that class earlier this week just to kind of get a better understanding of what they're doing. Uh, but it's, you know, just looking to campus to, to provide some resources. But um, this is this is new space for college athletics. I'd be remiss if I didn't add. Uh, it is, uh, you know, I am of the firm belief we do need a federal standard. We need Congress's help uh, to move forward. We are this notion that we are a normal business is not, uh, has never been the, the case for college athletics. And for whatever reason, this narrative keeps coming out. Uh, and, and the way we are structured, we, uh, we do need the assistance of Congress uh, to get a federal standard because the, we are creating inequities right. in college athletics. And that's something that, that uh, we are not allowed to create because of Title IX in college athletics. Yeah. Um, by the way, if you are still just joining us and we see, you know, we're still populating and we know hundreds are trying to get in. So welcome to you all. Again, the Goulston Stores, um, NACTA, NIL uh, webinar. If you have questions, please submit them by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I see some people doing that and we'll get to those as well. But I, I wanna bring in Julie Rupert, uh, the commissioner of the Northeast 10 Conference. Uh, she made the NCAA Division II history, uh, the first female commissioner in that division. But Julie, respond to the people who, and I kind of heard this, that, well, you know, Division II and three schools, and we have a lot of directors from two and three schools here. This doesn't really affect them. This is just for Division One. Your thoughts on that? Thanks, Robin. I, I, I feel uh, very much that I'm representing a large swath of the NSA membership that really looks a lot different than you know, Washington State and, and the University of Michigan here. Uh, and this is as new to us figuring this out uh, as, as even uh, the, the higher levels of Division I. You know, we're used to being creative and we're used to being resourceful. I think that's our mantra in Division Two and Three. And so I think this is just another challenge in that in that journey in within college athletics of figuring out uh, not so much a trickle down, but but seeing how it plays out at the highest levels and then the applicability for division two and three institutions of course division two very much a hybrid of uh, no, very few full scholarships division three without athletic aid you know these are student athletes that by and large are almost always contributing significantly to the cost of their education to be on campus this is these are not full ride uh, student athletes they're not uh, you know, um, the recipients of modes of transportation or, uh, you know, the, the facilities. And so I think this is represents a, a real opportunity for these student athletes, uh, but it poses uh, some, some large challenges for the institutions in managing them, because just like the student athlete experience uh, at Division Two II and Three is is different. Uh, so too is the staffing and the resources for the institutions themselves. So, yeah. you know, we we are encouraging as a conference membership for schools to similar to what um, you, you, my colleagues said, uh, understand their state laws, work with a team, utilize the resources that are on your campus. You're, they're really going to need to do this. Our, our institutions by and large are staffed with one compliance person. Uh, you know, attending to five to 600 student athletes. So it's going to be really important that uh, I think, um, Marty, you said it, you, you know, we're going to have to, it, it, one strategy is to understand what your competitors are. Uh, I would say at our level, it's, it's sharing knowledge because I think yeah. we're all in this together, uh, you know, to, to figure out what the next steps are. Well, and um, you know, some, oh, just one second and then I'll get to you, Marty, but I just want to mention that um, the, the people who want the athletes are definitely thinking about this. I've been reading about a guy named Steve Kennedy who founded the Atlanta-based Fans Meet Idols, who's going after what he calls tier two players. He said, you know, they maybe they have a fan following for some reason they're interesting and they have a social media following or they can build one. And this group has signed 42 athletes from 10 schools, Auburn, Baylor. Baylor. He says he's trying to help students avoid the big letdown. You know, there are students who are expecting a big payday, but not everyone's going to get one. So there's a Georgia Tech player who can give piano lessons, and he's already signing him up for that. Um, other students, other student players are going to be giving personalized phone machine messages uh, for, you know, maybe 40 bucks, 50 bucks. But in other words, he's looking exactly for the students 
who may not be in the million dollar deals. But Marty, go ahead. What were you what were you thinking? So thanks, Robin. I wanted to comment on something that Julie said because I think that the new NIL regime, this wild, wild west regime we're all facing now, uh, applies with as great vigor to division two and division three schools as division one. And let me tell you why. Division two and three schools still recruit top athletes from high schools. They may not get the stars that may go to Michigan or Washington State, or as we've seen Nick Saban talk about in the press over the last couple of days, they may go to Alabama, but these are still high school stars who may have an ability to monetize their NIL rights. Also, they recruit Olympic athletes. So there are other types of athletes who may want to monetize their NIL. And let's not forget about esports, which exist. Um, Julie, I'm not going to mention Quidditch, which is played at Middlebury, uh, but is not played at many other schools. But there are esports uh, out there, and esport participants are not subject, were never subject to NCAA regulation and could monetize their NIL rights before. So there are all these athletes who may be going to division two II and three schools. And looking at it just as a compliance issue, I think may be a little short-sighted here because these are big policy issues for division two II and three schools. They may not have the resources of a Washington state or a Michigan, but then there are other alternatives. Why shouldn't the conference put together at least a template which spans the different states, fill in the blank for your state's prohibitions. But you can get the schools to the same starting point and have a level playing field, at least among those schools in the conference for how they're going to recruit, how they're going to monetize and how they're going to generate additional revenues for themselves. One of the things that Ward mentioned was protection of intellectual property logo by the schools, critical for school. Mm -hmm. But here's where one and one may equal three. Why not allow student athletes in certain situations to use the school logo with your consent and both entities get paid? The schools get paid and the athletes get paid. So Marty, a I lot of opportunities. Stop, Marty, I want to stop you for a second there. Just because we have that question from Daryl Simpson. How are you balancing student athletes' use of your institutional logos? Does your policy allow student athletes to use your logo, let's say on TikTok, uh, where you know, you're monetizing that maybe through how many followers you have and then that takes you to another way to monetize yourself or promotional activities with companies that may or may not conflict with your sponsoring a company. So can I just ask Ward, what are you going to do about logos? So our, our state law is pretty clear and our policy is pretty clear that our student athletes can't use uh, our Michigan logo uh, to sell other products without our permission. So they can't, uh, you know, attach uh, the Block M or any of our intellectual property uh, to uh, sell something else uh, on on TikTok. However, they can uh, for their personal as they they wear stuff and they're not selling anything. They can have their you know Michigan uh, gear uh, on. We provide them with pictures uh, as student athletes. I'm sure uh, Pat and then Julie schools do the same thing. You know, we we give them pictures to to post. Uh, you know, they want that. They put them on their uh, social media feeds and those kind of things. Uh, but it, it, it becomes different when it's connected to selling something else. Our, also, our state law prevents a student athlete from uh, uh, using uh, our logos to go in direct competition with our corporate sponsors. So uh, we are a Coke school. Uh, they cannot uh, use and attach uh, the Michigan logo uh, to other products that may be competing with uh, our Coke sponsorship. We, Nike, Jordan brand, we they couldn't use uh, our logo to compete uh, or, or, or promote uh, other uh, products that compete with that. So on and on. So it, it is a protection and we do offer, we, we review there. The state law also allows for a seven day review of contracts, uh, which, you know, given where this started July 1 
and people going into contracts right away, it became hard. We, we allowed a grandfather period in of about two or three weeks. And now our student athletes uh, should be providing us with uh, copies of the contract for that direct purpose that, that we, we don't have these conflicts here at Michigan or in, in the same state, Michigan State. So those are the things that we are trying to put in place, but we will review just like we do anybody else who wants to come to us to use our logo, um, uh, attaching to a product as a corporate sponsor uh, or as a student athlete. Yeah, and I just want to ask uh, Pat Chan, a question's come in from Zach Fisher, and you just answered uh, quite a bit of it, Ward, you know, about, well, how, what are your guardrails for use of logos? And as you said, you have a state, you have some state laws, and you also have some, the school has thought about it. But Pat, part of that question was, can a school reduce the financial aid to a student who's suddenly making millions uh, through an outside company? So I think based on what Marty said earlier, that second prong of knowing the limitations provided by your state is more important, in my opinion, than understanding what your competitors have in effect. The current NCAA temporary legislation basically leaves it to the devices of the institution and the student athlete to understand the existing NIL law or any state ethics laws like Ward. I mean, Ward, the, the answer to, to logos is pretty cut and dry in the state of Michigan, pretty cut and dry in the state of Washington. So it is up to it is up to all parties involved to under have have a have a firm understanding before they engage in business activities what the laws are in place. So uh, relative to, to you know so I guess the reality is uh, what can or um, what can an institution do relative to aid? Well, I think that's a conversation for that institution to have amongst themselves with their conference office uh, with the NCAA uh, if they're willing to go down that road. But uh, this thing is so nuanced. Uh, that the ultimately, if someone, if a student, if we're recruiting a student athlete and they want to get into the NIL game, um, it's almost irrelevant what's going on in the state of Oregon for us or the state of California, because we're not going to be able to change our laws to compete with whatever, whatever uh, nuance that, that they are attracted to. So uh, I, we will have to have an understanding, just to understand what the rules of the game are. The other thing too, the rules are until we get some type of federal standard, odds are states are going to continue to adapt their rules to the lowest common denominator. And that's another challenge we're going to have in college athletics. So this is going to continue to evolve. And that's why I think it is just imperative. And you can hear it in Ward's tone. I mean, he's got a firm understanding of what the rules are in the state of Washington, just no different than myself and our staff, or excuse me, in the state of Michigan, no different than our staff has a firm understanding of what the rules that we have to engage in. We don't have a state NIL law, so we're obligated to follow the state of Washington ethics laws uh, with, with every decision we make. Yeah. Uh, Julie, I love the image of Quidditch at Middlebury, your um, alma mater in Vermont. I have actually been to a Quidditch game there. Um, but as this you know, goes along, and I want you all to jump in on this, uh, do you worry about boosters? I was reading about one in Florida who's come up with a plan to raise money through big events, you know, like concerts and festivals, money that he will then give to businesses who will then give that money to athletes at the school that he's boosting. And he says that's perfectly fine uh, under that Florida law. Do you worry about boosters getting involved in, you know, all boosters want to be closer to the athletes, um, that they somehow are involved in this in a way that might concern you? Um, you know, Robin, I'll be honest that we haven't heard that level of concern. Again, uh, the size and scope of our institutions uh, really dictate that uh, campus partnerships, pouring rights and such, uh, maybe campus generated, uh, local sponsorships, community based partnerships are probably more the norm for our institutions. And again, it's, it's awareness of, of those local entities. I think each one of our member institutions could point to some, uh, you know, local uh, donor or an alum that, uh, you know, wants to support the program. And again, as I think we've all said, it's going to, you know, be a real partnership to understanding, you know, we've had this debate, do you want to know on the front end or the back end uh, about these agreements, uh, you know, it, before student athletes enter into them. So I think this just goes to the bigger picture. Uh, for us to understand the, the depth of involvement, the potential for depth of involvement from 
you know, outside uh, entities, boosters. Uh, typically, again, I'll say, you know, those institutions are supporting the institution through the office of, you know, um, uh, annual giving and things like that. So again, I think we're creating the partnerships, just following up on the last question around financial aid. Again, because of our model for financial aid in division two and three, you know, our institutions are, are really being very clear about uh, NIL earnings that really could reduce uh, need-based aid, Pell Grant, uh, Pell Grants. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're having discussions around the student athlete's responsibility to contact financial aid. So, so again, this goes back to involving, you know, campus development and campus advancement and financial aid and admissions uh, all these things are going to really play into understanding the impact for our campuses. Well, and Ward, uh, we know that uh, schools can't directly pay students under NIL, um, but someone has asked, have you got, you know, what are students supposed to do? Is there someone whose title is helps athletes with NIL issues? You know, is there an office? What, what are you thinking? So let me, let me also answer that first question you sure. uh, asked, Julie. The answer is yes. We're worried about boosters uh, in a significant way because uh, it, it really ties into the integrity of the games. We, you know, we um, as ADs, and I'm sure she is a commissioner, you know, you worry about that before NIL. And now uh, when, you, when you read comments like that, I had not seen that comment. Uh, that uh, a booster is raising money to give to business to to basically bypass and you know pass through money to give directly to the student athletes. I mean that, that's that's not the what what the intent of this was. I mean the intent was that a kid who wanted to give a lesson or write a book or promote um, their business or uh, to legitimately promote another business would have that opportunity and can do it and be paid to do it just like any student on campus could, could be paid to do those things and create an app and, and sell it and, and get the money uh, either personally or through the company. Those, those was, that's what it was created for. It wasn't created uh, to just give kids money, uh, you know, through a pass-through system uh, and that concerns me because when you start to do that, you start to have undue influence uh, on those student athletes. Uh, you start to have issues, um, you know, at, at, that I worry about when you start to, to have gambling uh, and the things that have come online now, the influence uh, and the connection to people. Uh, we try to educate our coaches and our student athletes around what they should say. Uh, to people who ask a lot of questions about games and about, well, who's, you know, I saw so-and-so kind of twist his ankle. Is he able to play this week? I mean, all these people want to get close for different reasons and they want to provide. And our student athletes could get hurt. And we do have an obligation, in my opinion, to try to protect them uh, from uh, sort of getting involved. You mentioned mental health and that impact of getting involved and in, over their heads uh, into something. Yes, we're going to partner uh, in a short answer to, to your question just now, Robert, we're going to partner uh, and are looking to partner with several companies uh, that are in this space to educate our student athletes, to monitor, uh, and to really teach. Uh, like Pat, I'm in conversation uh, with one of our faculty to talk about the possibility in our business school, to talk about the possibility of a, a course similar to what Pat has uh, had uh, their business school uh, faculty develop there. Uh, but right now we have about four of my staff, compliance, marketing, uh, licensing, corporate licensing, that are all together as a team in responding to questions and helping our student athletes as they uh, develop uh, these, um, uh, you know, connections and in, in, uh, NIL opportunities. And we have legal counsel that reviews uh, any contracts that come in around that just to, to be able to protect uh, again, the Michigan brand and hopefully protect the student athlete. Marty Edel, again, the Gulston store, uh, Stores, Gulston Stores lawyer, who's been thinking long and hard about these issues. Um, so we just heard uh, a school that's going to partner with some organizations that can help them with the many issues, mental health, business, investment, finance, agentry. Smaller schools can't do that. You know, they, uh, that might be overwhelming. And I have from Daryl Bailey a question, how much input, input will coaches in the administration have in providing instruction to student athletes 
uh, about NIL opportunities. As a lawyer, what are you thinking? Are you thinking schools should have firewalls so that they can never be accused of you know, favoritism with one athlete or misleading an athlete and directing them to a company that maybe benefited someone at the school? I can't even think what it'd be. So are you thinking firewall or a help and direct? So that's a great question. I'm thinking along a multi-dimensional phase. So let me start off with two ideas that were touched upon and then go into not really a firewall because all these problems are ones with which people can deal. So take gambling, Ward mentioned that. A number of schools are opposed to any form of student gambling. But what are FanDuel's and DraftKings now? Is that gambling? How do you deal with it? Um, do you prohibit students from being sponsors of FanDuel's and DraftKings? And if you do, and you know, what is next? Do you also prohibit them from endorsing casinos? New Jersey has a law which says you cannot endorse casinos and gambling. Now take look at Nevada. Nevada doesn't have that law because casinos and gambling are legal activities in the state of Nevada. So are you putting your student athletes at a competitive disadvantage to, for instance, UNLV? Um, or other schools in Nevada because you don't have that. These are long and hard decisions which need to be made at a policy level. Uh, second was student aid. And Julie hit the nail on the head there. there lots of questions regarding Pell Grants and whether you have to consider NIL dollars as to reduce the amount you can get under Pell Grants. There are in fact three states which have laws which say Schools need to reduce financial aid by the amount of dollars that a student athlete gets uh, from NIL endorsements. Well, are those states now putting their students at a competitive disadvantage if they go to schools in those states? But I also wanted to come back to the question, Robin, that you just asked, and that's really is a more broadly, what are the risks to colleges and universities from this great new wild, wild west of NIL rights? And the fact is there are risks, but they are dealable with if you know what they are. First risk that I, and this is not in any particular order, do you wanna put speech limitations on your students? If you're a public university, you're gonna have a bigger problem doing that than if you're a private university. Um, to the extent students endorse products on Twitter with pornographic laden invective. Uh, well, the US Supreme Court a few weeks ago held schools can't prohibit that if it's not essential to the school's function. So maybe you, can, you have to understand those laws in order to deal with them. Uh, are the schools doing an adequate job in their policies? And, I've looked, for instance, at Michigan's policy, its NIL policy, and it's a terrific policy. It's three pages, single spaced, um, and it cuts through most of the issues. But it doesn't get into the details yet because I think those need to be worked out uh, and we'll see what happens with them. But does it discuss the risks for the student athlete for violating a policy? Um, what if the student athlete misses this seven day period for turning in a contract, a potential endorsement contract, uh, or fails to disclose sponsorship activities? Is there a process there created for going through those um, particular points? And what is, you know, for as much as the student has to disclose, you have, what is the obligation of the university to disclose its products and its endorsements. For example, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola makes a lot of beverage products. Michigan may have a deal with Coca-Cola. I don't know, I've never seen it. I wanna put that uh, qualifier in that says that it, it is exclusive to Coca-Cola for all its products. Well, that makes it easy. A student then can't come in and have a Pepsi a juice drink or a Pepsi water drink because Michigan and go to Michigan. 
but does the student know that in advance of coming in? Is there a policy in effect so that the student can see what her or his options may be at the school rather than being surprised on day one after enrolling in the school and finding that that particular student's endorsements are out the window? And going specifically, Robin, to the question that you asked, schools have to be very, very careful in what opportunities they're going to create for students. Um, coaches don't want to hawk products. Uh, and I'm sure my colleagues on this panel will say probably rule number one is coaches don't hawk a brand uh, for which you're getting compensated or for which you can be compensated. But it goes further than that. Um, what if the student athlete comes to the school and says, you know, I got this licensing deal uh, in the works. What would you advise? Is the school going to undertake what we call a fiduciary obligation to the student, which is a heightened level of obligation to the student by saying yes or no? Or does it want to become, in fact, an agent for the student by saying yes or no um, to what's there? So you need clear rules to help define that because the schools don't want to take on enhanced responsibility for those. And remember, many of these students are 18 when they come in. Most of them are under 21 by the time they put together most of these NIL deals. And they're still minors in the face of many state laws. Um, and with respect to logos, and this will be the last point I want to do, uh, I want to touch on on here. What are the schools doing to ensure that the logos don't conflict, if they give their consent, that they're for products for which there is not a conflict. State laws are great, but I don't recall any state that has a law which defines what a conflict is between the university and the student. They say you cannot conflict, and Michigan's is like that. You cannot create a conflict. But how do you define that? Is that going to be worked out in the process? The last thing schools need is to undertake legal liability uh, for their actions. They want to, as Pat so eloquently said, educate and empower their students. They want their students to be successful, but they don't want their students to sue them. Yeah, great information. And I can't believe, I mean, this is this this time has flown and we have just a few minutes and I, I want to just go to Pat Chung with a question. You know, Ward mentioned what many people feel, you know, watching students not make anything for their efforts while schools did. And there's a feeling of, yeah, it's about time that students per, per, partook, could take part in um, some of that windfall. On the other hand, there, there are concerns and we've heard a lot of them. What is your thinking overall? Because this could be just the greatest thing uh, where student athletes uh, have, well, it could, be, it could be a problem, which, and we've listed a lot of them, you know, teams that can't co you know, be as tight as they once were because of different kids making different amounts of money, kids feeling left out of that, kids not knowing how to handle uh, some of the money. On the other hand, we could see, um, student golfers suddenly being as big a deal as football because we live in a different age. We have social media and, and kids have a better ability to become well-known on social media for things that aren't just football. So how are you looking at this? Are, uh, you know, are you looking at this as potential for great or and new and different or problem-laden? Well, I'll just add this as different as college athletics is across division one, two or three, and even PAC 12 and big 10 power five group of five. The one thing every athletic department does have in common is the diversity of its student athlete, uh, student athletes that they serve or that we all serve. And as we go forward, um, I know work well enough and hearing Julie speak, protecting the student athlete experience that we are empowered to serve and deliver to them, uh, which ultimately leads toward life changing uh, a life-changing semester, year, or up to five years on a college campus that ultimately leads, ultimately leads to a degree or multiple degrees. And along that path, learning, learning how to become the best version of themselves. 
how does this evolve now with NIL, I think is where the concern, thoughts, or opportunities are, depending on your perspective. But at the end of the day, this still comes down to, we all are a part of this academic enterprise uh, that uses sports to commingle with the academic side of campus. This NIL piece is new. It's long overdue. Our student athletes should have had the right to monetize their name, image, or likeness many years ago. Social media changed the need uh, and the opportunity space. But now going forward, um, we have these young people on our campus that have more opportunities, but still we need to provide them with the great coaching uh, that our coaches offer, the great uh, sports medicine, nutrition, uh, uh, professors on our campus that ultimately lead to a degree. And uh, this does change. NIL is an opportunity for many. And, and the reality is NIL is not going to be for everybody. We have student athletes that are electing not to engage in it because, uh, you know, they were, you know, right now they're focused on, uh, a, you know, you know, everyone has a different strategy. Everyone comes, you know, people come to, we have young people coming to campus with zero social media. And we have young freshmen coming to campus with, you know, a hundred thousand followers. Um, what, what is the difference? Well, you know, it's just what their priorities are because they're so different and, you know, it's our job to serve, serve the needs of all of our student athletes. So, uh, this is just one layer of what the responsibilities of everyone that we have on our campuses and all the great practitioners on the zoom, but it's something like everything that has happened over the last century in college athletics, we're going to adapt, we're going to figure it out and we're going to move forward. And Julie, you have some, you know, maybe a minute of closing thoughts. Oh, Julie, I think you're muted. I figured that would happen. You know, I, I want to speak. Uh, I, I completely agree with what Pat just said. And, and I think within Division II, we really champion uh, the, the balance and the, the student athlete experience. And uh, it's, you're exactly right, Pat. It's not unique. It's, uh, it may be different across the divisions, but we all serve uh, the same goal in educating and uh, having these students move through and graduate and become, you know, engaged citizens in a rapidly changing and diverse world. And if NIL and the ability to monetize uh, helps them along that journey, uh, I think it's incumbent on all of us to, uh, you know, take take Marty's list of the issues and the risks and and figure out the answers to them. Right, figure out how to keep moving forward. Uh, and and we all have the same end game, which is the diploma and the job and this, you know, the, the success in life. So I think, uh, you know, maybe this conversation is a little bit different a year from now when we've all sort of rolled up our sleeves and, and poked holes at where the, the challenges are. But uh, I think I think we we know enough about each other to know that, that we're all collegial and we're going to work together and uh I think the the end can be a positive thing. We're obviously dealing with a lot of patchworks here, so it's it's not easy. But um, I I do believe it is. I also agree it's the right thing. We just have to figure out how to how to be solution oriented here. Ward, I have to say I want to get your closing thoughts, but these questions are coming in. Chris Wager writes: Do you foresee any issues with a student violating a term of the NIL contract? And then the company they were receiving this big compensation from asking for reimbursement or a student transfers and the company ends the terms of the contract and the student is not able to pay it back. I mean, just the things that people are thinking about. Ward, your thoughts on... The answer to the, those questions is yes. I, <laughs> I anticipate a lot of things happening. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to go back to one of the things Pat said. We, we dealt with this... Um, five, 10 years ago, maybe when we, we allowed the student athletes to work and there was this, oh my God, what are we going to do? And how's this going to change the culture of athletics? And we're letting kids work and, and it worked out. Uh, you know, I have uh, uh, a degree in business administration from here, master's degree. And one thing I know about the free market is the free market will calibrate itself. Uh, to a certain degree, I worry about the recruiting because you know, fans want to help uh, and they see this as one avenue of help, but the free market will uh, find a way to balance itself out. Uh, we just have to get through this as we get to uh, a lot of the things that Marty said are not in our policy are not in our policy because we can't think of everything uh, so quickly. Uh, this dropped July 1st. This, this is 21 days into NIL. NIL. The NCAA didn't uh, changed the structure of the rule to June 30th. Uh, we didn't know what that was going to say. We know what our law is going to say, but 
so we're working through this. And that's why at the top of our policy, Marty, my staff was smart enough to say, this is a working policy. We have a right to change and adapt and, and put things into this policy because that is how new it is. Uh, and we want to both, as I said earlier, support and protect um, our student athletes and our university at the same time. So I just want to thank everybody on the panel. And Robin, uh, I am a big fan of yours. Uh, and uh, anything Lynn asked me to do, uh, he knows I'm going to show up for. And, and I enjoyed meeting Julie and, and Marty and, and Pat has been a friend for a while. Uh, and so um, thank you all. And thanks to NACTA. Uh, I, uh, I have enjoyed my year of service as the president uh, and uh, look forward. To, we have a convention coming up uh, next week, a virtual convention, and uh, look forward to seeing many of you uh, at that as well. So thanks. I'm mute, Rob. Robin, you're on mute. Well, I may be on mute, but there's a picture of you and your wife up there. <laughs> so let me just <laughs> close that with um, NACTA President Ward Manuel, uh, University of Michigan, Pat Chun, uh, Washington State University, Julie Rupert, Commissioner of Northeast 10 Conference, and Marty Edel, uh, Goulston Stores. Uh, you know, just there's so much here. I, I thank you all so much. And I'm going to throw it back to Len DeLuca and apparently his wife, who's there too. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Oops, that's what I, that's me. Okay. Yeah, there he is. Uh, I, wanted, I, want, I want to thank everybody. And I want to thank particularly Rob. Oh, I'm sorry. Headphone? I want to I want to thank Robin for uh, absolutely doing a great job and uh, in realizing that uh, Matt Damon uh, and the Cannes Film Festival was her lounge act for this in her interview on Wednesday for uh, here and now. I want to thank uh, everybody for joining and uh, and and particularly the people behind the scenes. I would like to thank the people at NACTA, Kara Dietzel, Dana Leroy, and of course, my dear old friend from the 92 Final Four, Bob Vecchioni, and, and from Goulston and Stores, the team of uh, Liz Sobe and Kelly Urgo. Um, this is a, the impetus for this college sports law practice came together as a result of an incredible collision of worlds of business and law. And we look forward to continuing that conversation with all of you. We thank NACTA. Uh, this is our first uh, Goulston and Stores webinar with you. And we look forward to many more and the evolution of uh, name, image, and likeness and everything else.